Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison, or the grave. It started with an Indian gift of a piece of pottery and led to a brown bear and moccasins. An archaeologist, much laughing water, and finally, death in an alley. But just to make matters worse, the Indian giver was a female and 100% genuine hot-blooded Apache. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Indian Giver. By day, the industrial heart of any city is just so much steel and stone and streets. Jammed full with the raucous sounds of a thousand and one different machines. But by night, all of that is gone, and there are only endless, smooth sided, lonely canyons that overflow with a steady, humming silence that everywhere hangs like a distant echo of the day that's passed. And Los Angeles was no exception at nine o'clock at night, as I pulled up and parked in front of a grace curtain storefront on a deserted downtown street that marked the showroom of the wholesale curio dealer who had telephoned my office an hour earlier. And in a Dutch accent laced tight with worry, it urged me to call on him at once. A raised gold lettering on a side door that showed a strip of yellow light at the threshold said Alex Van Nord, private, in an ornate 18th century script. So when I knocked, I was ready for something continental with thick bifocal glasses. When the door swung open, my jaw dropped to my chest. And I couldn't help gaping because the huge V of a man in front of me, in cheap, snug clothes, who had dark hair, dark skin, and darker eyes had to be no less than a full-blooded American Indian. Moccasins and all. What you want? Uh, Mr. Van Ord, is he in? Name your business. Well, it's personal. What's yours? Hate. For those who would destroy our culture... Oh! Oh. Mr. Marlowe. Oh. Mr. Marlowe. Let me help you up, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Fenor. Uh, Are you all right? Oh, sure, sure. I'm fine. Hey, that engine, he certainly can hit hard, oh, huh? Oh, yes, I know. He also struck me down. Oh? Ah, I tell you, Mr. Marlowe, it's terrible. Yeah, it's also a little confusing, Mr. Van Nord. Hey, exactly why did you call me in the first place? Oh, well, it began this morning when I received a shipment of Indian curios from my buyer in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh? Well, Everything in the crate was in order, except one extra piece of pottery, a bowl. Bowl? Indian bowl? Yes, yes. Oh. It appeared no place on the invoice. Oh, I didn't pay much attention to it till I noticed that the two-inch wide band of inscriptions near the top were not like any others I'd ever seen. Inscriptions, huh? Yeah. No, oh, you mean those Indian signs, broken arrow, deer, wigwam kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so my curiosity was aroused, and I called my representative in Santa Fe. Uh-huh. However, he knew nothing of the bowl either, so finally, well, I put it in my display window there and forgot about it until about noon when a frail, sandy-haired man stepped in. You know his name? No, no. Uh-huh. Only that he said he was an archaeologist and that he wanted to buy the bowl. You refused to sell it, huh? Uh, Why? For two reasons, Mr. Marlowe. One, I could see that he was fighting hard to control his enthusiasm. And two, I had no idea what to charge for the bowl. Mm-hmm. I told him to come back tomorrow again, and then I removed the bowl from the window. It wasn't until five o'clock that the second visitor appeared. Another archaeologist? No, no. A beautiful girl named Mona Waters. Oh. She was very sophisticated, wore an expensively tailored white... Uh, smart suit, no jewelry she wore whatsoever. Mm. Uh, she described the bowl I had placed in my storeroom perfectly and then asked if I had seen such a piece of pottery or if I had one for sale. I said no. Same reasons? More or less. Mm-hmm. Anything else, Mr. Van Orn? Well, there isn't much more. The young lady gave me her address, the Walker Hotel on Wilshire Boulevard, uh, room 515. Walker Hotel, uh, asked me to call her if I came across a bowl like the one she described. Then she left. Naturally, my interest at this time was near the bursting point. Naturally. What'd you do about it? Uh, the only sensible thing I knew of. 
At six o'clock, I closed my place and I went to the public library to borrow a book on hieroglyphics of the Indians of the Southwest. When I got back, I found the rear door forced and poof, the ball was gone. And you called me? Huh? Yes. Then this Indian shows up. He claims I would rob his people of everything and then he hit me. Makes perfect sense to him, no doubt. Yes. No. Will you try to recover the ball for me, please? Well, if you can answer one question without stumbling, yes. Huh? Why no police, Mr. Van Nord? Uh, because objects of art, Mr. Marlowe, aside from their intrinsic worth, and, and the clay bowl has none, are only valuable for resale. Create a public disturbance, such as the police, and the thief will destroy the object and another day steal again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, please, please, you try, Mr. Marlowe. Huh? Yeah, I'll try, all right, Mr. Van Nord. And when it comes to our two-fisted brave who's so crazy about the preservation of Indian culture... I'll try real hard. Good night, sir. Van Nord's enthusiasm and the hundred bucks he pressed into my hand before I left were encouraging, and I drove straight to the Walker Hotel on Wilshire Boulevard, where a moment after I entered the plush lobby, encouragement came once more. Because gliding from a travel agency booth toward a cocktail lounge was what my client had described as beautiful girl, expensively tailored, smart white suit, no jewelry whatsoever. But when we were both inside and at adjoining stools at the bar, where the soft lights accented her high cheekbones and jet black hair, I knew that Mr. Van Nord had skipped something important. Because in spite of a full mouth, neatly rouged, eyebrows penciled come hither in a coiffure shingled vintage 1949, Mona Waters could also be full-blooded American Indian. Which is what I was working on when she turned, blew a smoke signal in my face, and spoke with an accent that was about as Apache as Vassar. Don't let me make you lose your place, but... Uh... Do you mind telling me why you're staring? I collect the reasons for a hobby. You know, like some people save stamps. Uh-huh. And others pottery. Pot... Who are you? A ceramics fiend named Smith. Now, Mona, let's talk about you, huh? Why? Because I've already been offered $10,000 for the bowl. What? Good enough? You have the bowl where? Well, not in my pocket, honey. It's too bulky. I've got it tucked safely away outside in my car. Oh? Yeah, you know... You didn't hide it very well after you stole it from Van Nord. You've been in my room. Could be. Now, do we talk business, yes or no? Yes. What do you want to know? Well, for one thing, what's the bowl to you? Everything. It's mine. All mine, via primogeniture. Which is Apache for what? Listen, Mr. Smith. I'm an Indian, all right, and an Apache at that. But I was born in a duplex, not a teepee. I drink martinis, not fire water, and I've got a Mills College diploma and an IQ that'll probably make yours look sick, so let's clear the air in a hurry. Yeah, well, let's clear enough. Yeah. Now, smart boy, my late Uncle George Waters, also known as Chief Laughing Waters, giggle if you want to, own the bowl you want $10,000 for. So? So a long time ago, he willed it to my father. However, my father died a year ago, leaving only me as heir apparent. Since that bowl is mine, all mine, via primogeniture, which brings us right back to where we were. Except you haven't mentioned why the bowl means so much to you. And I won't. No, will you pay the 10,000 bucks, huh? I didn't say that. And I won't say anything more until I see that bowl. Now, I've got to make a couple of calls. It should take about 20 minutes. After that, I'll be in my room. Please call before you come up. And if you don't have the bowl, don't, don't come, come up. Don't come up. Okay, baby, fair enough. So long. It had been the kind of conversation piece wherein each party's quite sure that the other's a liar, but not quite sure why. So a moment after I was on the sidewalk and out of Mona's sight, I darted for the side of the hotel in the rear entrance where I made my way to a self-service freight elevator that got me to the fifth floor, just as the Apache with gloss closed the door to a room at the far end of the carpeted hallway. I was about halfway there when it came. The door to 515 wasn't locked, and when I threw it open, I found about what I'd expected. Mona slumped in a corner of the room, pride heard only, and opposite her a wide-open window, which I figured led to a fire escape, until I was standing next to it and saw that there was nothing but sheer wall that plunged five stories to the sidewalk below, and on a line with the hotel's fourth floor, a rooftop that at best was a good 15 feet away. When I closed the window and turned back to the room, Mona was already on her feet. That sly jerk, he waited till I had the door closed behind me, and then he swung. Oh, brother, when we meet again. Oh, Mona, who? Did he get the ball? The bowl? I thought you had that, Smith. I was kidding, and you know it. Now, once more, who was it? His name, Mona. Jimmy Brown Bear. Jimmy which? Brown Bear. 
Smitty, a lot of Indians have Indian names. It's a custom. Try not to fall apart every time you hear one. I will if you'll stop being persecuted. I think Indians are all good Americans. Now tell me about the big brown bear. Okay. All right. <laughs> He's absolutely stole the bow, the priceless tribal heirloom the white man's trying to steal. He's plain nuts. Who else would try a jump like that from a fifth-story window? Yeah, quite a hop. If he actually made it. What do you mean, if? Nobody fell. No, maybe nobody jumped either. Maybe you make up heap big story, baby. Hide bowl here in closet, then fall on floor. Tell Wild Taylor, screwball Apache. That'd be smart. Yeah, heap. But also smart if you take long nose out of engine girl's affairs before it gets blown off. Stand still, buster. Yo, tomahawk, caliber 38. How unfriendly. But effective. Now, Smith, what's your real name? Sammy Blue Ox. My father Listen, calls me... Junior, let me clear up a very important point. That Indian bowl, in some strange way, is the answer to the location of enough lost Spanish gold to keep you, me, and everyone we ever met off the bread line from here on out. Okay, I'm intrigued, but the points you were going to clear up. Just this. I've got a dandy idea where I can find both the bowl and Jimmy Brown Bear right now. That's something I want to do all by my lonesome. Now back into that closet and keep quiet. Well, you head where? On the warpath, via bus. I'm a hot-blooded Apache, remember? So long, baby. There are times when things look black enough without staying put in a dark closet. So I kicked the lock, sprung the casing, and walked out in room 515 just in time to hear a timid knock on a hall door. When it opened up, one frail, sandy-haired man wanted information. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, sir. Hmm? Can you possibly tell me where I can find Miss Mona Waters? Who are you? <laughs> My name is Clark Erskine. I, I'm an archaeologist. Yeah, I'm sorry, friend. I can't say any more than Miss Waters is out after a wild-eyed Apache who's got a piece of pottery tucked underneath his arm. What? Oh, not the bowl. It's supposed to be in Van Nort's place. Not Jimmy Brown Bear. Yeah, right on both counts, Mr. Erskine, but... What makes the name Brown Bear ring a bell? You two met before? Well, we certainly have. Hmm. Why, that idiot has hampered every archaeologist who has so much as set foot in New Mexico. Well, now that you've mentioned it, Mr. Erskine, why your keen interest in the bowl? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? Yeah. Well, my good men, those inscriptions circled around it are going to prove invaluable. Possibly another uh, Rosetta Stone. An open sesame to the countless undecipherable writings we've already collected. About Spanish gold, maybe. Huh? Spanish, hmm. Spanish gold? Oh, well, sir, what are you talking about? Nothing. Look, Erskine, one question. How did you know that Mona Waters was staying here at this hotel? Well, it wasn't simple How to learn. Uh, when Mr. Van Nord refused to sell the bowl to me until tomorrow, mm -hmm. I wanted to be certain that he also didn't sell it to anyone else. So I watched his showroom. Oh, that's smart. <laughs> Though when I saw Miss Waters there, I recognized her at once as an Apache. And I followed her here, where I found out her name and room number. Now, I'm going to wait for her until she returns. I'm not going to give up. That bowl means now, too much. Now, wait a minute. Much. Wait Why a minute. You... Hold it, Erskine. You happen to know Jimmy Brown Bear's hometown? Come on, quick. Well, yes, I do. It's, it's Sacona, New Mexico. Sacona, New Mexico? Yes. By bus. Thank you, friend. I'm sorry to have to leave you to do your waiting alone, but i got to catch a bus. But where, Mr. Marlowe? At the downtown Central Bus Depot to put cart before horse, to turn tables, a switch. In short, Mr. Erskine to track an Indian. So long. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, you meet many an old friend from the wide field of music every Sunday afternoon when the choral ears and the symphonette are heard on most of these same CBS stations. This Sunday, the fine voices of the choral ears will recall such old favorites as I've Been Working on the Railroad, The Best Things in Life Are Free, and Janine, I Dream of Lilac Time. The symphonette will bring you the overture from the Bohemian Girl, a Strauss composition, and a stirring march, among others. Be sure to hear the symphonette and the choral ears to find your old friends and favorites every Sunday. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Indian Giver. Tracking an Indian over the busy concrete of downtown Los Angeles sounds a lot tougher than it turned out to be. Apparently, a six-feet-four Apache in a full-crown black hat and moccasins was an oddity even in a city of oddities. And everyone who'd seen him remembered him, from the guy behind the bus depot's ticket desk to the newsboy outside the flop house nearby, where Jimmy Brown Bear had made camp. The next bus was still 45 minutes away, 
So I decided to visit the flop house. But Jimmy Brown Bear must have seen me coming and was expecting trouble. Because when I stepped into the hall, I saw him duck out the back door to the alley. I ran after him and watched him turn down what would have been a dead end to a normal man. But Jimmy made a jump at a nine-foot wall, caught the top, and was pulling himself up when it happened. <laughs> Jimmy stiffened on the wall. <laughs> when the second shot came, he dropped rigidly like a poison fly and lay very still. I started over to him, but stopped at the excited voice of a cabbie running toward me from the open end of hey, the alley. Hey, mister. Hey, mister. Hey, what happened? I heard a couple of shots, Jimmy, and I... Uh-oh. Yeah, that's what you heard. Holy mackerel. Hey, wait, wait. That's the Indian. You mean you knew him, too? Yeah, I hauled him around in my cab tonight. Who did it, mister? You? Ah, oh, don't be silly, will you? The shots could have come from any place. Any one of those windows is own fire escape. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, between those buildings there that... Hey, that dame running for the street, will you get out of my way? Not so fast, buddy. You know her? Yes, I know. I'm Mona Waters. Brother, will you get the cops over here right away, will you? I gotta catch that girl. No chance, mister. She's long gone. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Marlo, is that you? Van Nord. <sighs> Well, I certainly didn't expect to find you here. What in the world is going on here? Among other things, murder. Yeah, it's that Indian, Mr. Van Nord, the same one. What? Good heavens. Mr. Marlowe, did, did this happen because of the bowl? No doubt. Mona Waters just got away between those two buildings. Oh. I'm pretty sure she's the one who took the bowl out of your place tonight because Jimmy Brown Bear got it away from her later. Now she's got it back again and he winds up like that. Then you think the girl killed him to recover the bowl? Right now, I'm too balled up to think anything. Say, just a minute. How do you manage to show up here? Uh, why, I... I started home in this man's taxi and found out that he was the one who brought Mr. Brown Bear to my shop tonight. Yeah, that's right. I picked the Indian up right out here on the corner. Uh, so we came down here because I thought if we found where the Indian was staying, it might be a help to you, Marlo. You were waiting in the cab when he was shot? No. No, I started into this place alone, and then I... Thought better of it and came out to get you, Cabby, to come in with me. And then I heard the shots. Mm -hmm. Now look, Mr. Van Oort, you better keep your nose out of this mess. Huh? Go on home and sit on your curios. I'll call you when I got something. <laughs> Assuming that my client's story was true and that he did have the cabby to back him up, I got in my car and headed back to the Walker house. I parked at the side of the hotel and started for that convenient rear door again when... I saw the commotion of half a dozen excited passers-by bending over a man stretched out on the sidewalk. Hey, how do you like that? It's enough to make a fatalist out of you, ain't it? Absolutely. What happened? Why, that poor guy there is walking along minding his own business and practically gets his back broke by a hunk of pottery some jerk must have heaved out of one of them windows up there. Pottery? You mean a bowl, maybe? A bowl? I, I, I don't know. It broke all the smithereens. It was plenty heavy, though. It was about... Hey, hey, look, look. Here's a chunk of it. Let me see that. Oh, sure. Brown clay with symbols carved on it. Indian symbols. Listen, uh, buddy, what window did that come out of? Anybody see? Anybody? No, no. They're all dark up there. We can't figure it out. We just... Hey, what's the matter? Where are you going? There was no doubt about it. A broken piece of pottery I'd clenched in my hand must have come from the Indian bowl. I ran inside, rode the elevator up to the fifth floor again, and beat it down the hall to 515. Sprawled out on the floor inside was Clark Erskine, the archaeologist, making a valiant but wobbly effort to get back on his feet. I dropped a chunk of bowl in my pocket and gave him a hand. Come on, fella. What? Up you go. Come on. Was it? All right. Take it easy. What? What? Now sit over here and tell me what happened to you. Where am I? Oh, who are you? Marlowe, Marlowe. Remember, you're oh. in room 515 of the Walker house. Oh. When I left, you were waiting for Mona Waters, but I came back to find you spread out on the floor, as flat as that puddle of ink there on the desk blotter. Now, you take it. How come all this? Oh, yeah, yes, I, I remember now. I was struck. Yeah, yeah. But, Marlo, the, the, the lights are out. And they're better left that way unless you want the room full of irate citizens. Who struck you? I have no idea. I was sitting at the desk there writing Miss Waters a note because I, I decided not to wait any longer when I was hit from behind. That explains the spilled ink. What about the open window? It was closed when I left. Open window? Why, 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 why that's strange. Strange? It's screwy. Nuts. What do you mean? Mr. Marlowe, just what is your position in this business? I'm a private detective working for Mr. Van Nord, and I'll tell you something else. Whoever slugged you, open that window and sail the precious Indian bowl right out into thin air, five stories high. Oh. Smashed down there on the sidewalk. Oh, the, the, the bowl is gone? Destroyed? Mm hmm Oh, no. Oh, yes. Well, that's hideous. The markings on that bowl were priceless. Why, Marlowe, great Scott, why was it destroyed? That's what I mean. See, it's screwy. Oh, wait a minute, I'll get it. Oh. Hello? Mona Waters, please. It's urgent. 
Interstate Airlines calling. She's out. I'll take the message. Oh, thank heavens. We want to rectify a perfectly ghastly mistake. We're afraid the relief operator may have given Miss Waters 2.12 a.m. instead of 1.12 a.m. as the departure time of her plane tonight. But maybe it's 12.30 now. If she leaves at 1.12... I she... know. We're just sick about it. Can she make it? I hope not. But I'll do my best to deliver your message in person. You're a dear girl for calling. Goodbye. What was it, Marlowe? Something important. Not archaeologically. I'll see you later. Oh, wait, wait. Isn't there anything we can do about the bow? Yeah, oh, sure. Get a bottle of glue and a dustpan and hop to it. So long, Erskine. I'm off to the field of the Thunderbirds. Now, look, officer, I was just... Never mind. Well, Mac, you're batting a thousand. You pulled out of the hotel driveway two blocks back, ran one full stop and a red signal getting this far. That's great. So what's your story? Been drinking? Not a drop, believe me. Now, look, I've got to get to the airport in a hurry. Why? To catch an Indian girl. A guy named Jimmy Brown Bear was murdered tonight because a bowl was stolen. Wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it. Who was murdered? Oh, I know. What's it? There's no use in going into it. Officer, my name is Marlowe. I'm a private detective working on a case, and i got to get to the airport. Private eye, huh? Let's see your papers. Oh, sure, sure. Here. They're, they're all here. I... I... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Philip Marlowe, license number. Hey, what's eating you? What are you mm-hmm. staring at? Blue black lines on the palm of my hand. They, they look just like... Holy smoke, they are. That's the answer. I gotta get back to that hotel. It's a matter of life and death. Now, just please, a minute. give me a ticket. Give me three tickets. Only let me get back to the Walker House right now. Will your life depends on it? You better be right, Marlowe. Wait till I stop the traffic, then make a U turn. <laughs> now go ahead. <laughs> Made it back to the hotel in something under seven minutes for the round trip. I ran for the elevator, waited for the car to come down, and when the gate opened, bumped head on into Clark Erskine oh, himself. I backed him into the elevator again at gunpoint and pushed the fifth floor button. I didn't say a word. By the time the elevator stopped and the gate slid open, he was beginning to sweat. Marlow, I, I, I just don't understand this. Why the gun? Take a guess, Erskine. I want to know what happened to Mona Waters. Why, I, I don't know. She, she didn't come back. Here, this is 515. Remember, go on, open it up. And get inside. <coughs> now, listen, you. I know who killed Jimmy Brown Bear, and I found out plenty about the bull, so talk. Where's Mona? Behind you with a gun in my hand, so don't move. Oh, great. Well, at least you're okay. Except for a headache, yes. I just woke up in the bedroom with a heap big lump on my scalp, and I know a pale face who's going to pay for that. Drop your gun, Marlow. Drop it. Now, who's this character here, and where's the bow? Marlowe headed Miss Waters. I, I saw him hit you and take it. I, I tried to stop him, but he hit me too. My name is Erskine. I'm an archaeologist. I only wanted to make a scientific study of the bowl, but this vandal here has destroyed it. Destroyed it? Marlowe! Pipe down, Red Wing, and listen. Before you start shooting, there's a lot of wampum at stake of nothing else. Now keep that in mind. Okay, Big Wind, start blowing. Speak your piece and keep it straight. He's a treacherous liar, Miss Waters. I know I'm braced for that. No, oh, you sweetheart, you. All right. The inscription's on that bowl with a key to the treasure, which is probably no news to you two. You didn't know how to work it, Mona. But Erskine here did. He found out that some of the lines were etched into the clay and others were raised, like the face of type in a printing press. Do I go on? Pray do, Professor. All right, now look. If you look closely, beautiful, you'll see ink on his fingers. Also, you'll notice that a bottle of ink poured out on your desk blotter there made the same kind of ink pad you use for a rubber stamp. That ink was spilled by accident. Now, don't listen to him because... Shut up! Go on, Marlowe. Well, after he knocked you out and left you in the bedroom, all he had to do was roll that wide, flat border of the bowl through the ink. Then roll it again over blank paper and it printed. What's more, baby, if we look real close, we'll find a perfect printed map on your hotel stationery stuck in one of his inside pockets. No, you don't. You'll never get the chance. Marlowe, the gun on the floor is gone. Jack, Mona, lights out. Marlowe? Marlo, are you all right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Oh. Then I, I did shoot the right man. Cream and sugar, Miss Walters? Well, that's about the story, Mr. Van Orden. Uh. Mona here slipped the Indian bowl into your shipment to keep it away from the guys she knew were after it. And, of course, she had to follow the bowl here to L.A. Erskine followed her. I see. Mm. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Positively amazing. 
Marlo, how did you discover that the intricate pattern on the bowl worked like a printing press? Oh, well, after Erskine had made his print of the map, he threw the bowl out the window to smash it so no one else could duplicate it. I got hold of a chunk of it and clenched it in my hand. I found out later when I passed that cop my credentials that the chunk of pottery had left separate distinct lines of ink on my palm. Terribly clever, isn't he, Mr. Van Noo? Oh, take it easy, baby. Uh, <laughs> indeed, he is clever, Miss Waters. But what of poor Jimmy Brown Bear? Well, Erskine followed me from the hotel to Jimmy's place and shot him, so I'd never have a chance to talk to him. He was a ruthless little guy, Clark Erskine. But if he survives that bullet wound, the state will get him for murder. Yes. Oh, Miss Waters, you'll have to hurry and finish your breakfast so that you can catch your plane. Uh, but before you go, I have a little gift for you. <laughs> Excuse me, I'll get it. And Marla, speaking of gifts, I have one for you. Come here. Yo, baby, that's nice. <laughs> Is it for keeps? Of course not, silly. I'm an Indian giver, remember? <laughs> when I come to town again, I'll be rich and reckless and loaded with all that old Spanish gold. And that's when I'll take my gift back again. With interest. So long, Silver. <laughs> Well, when I finally got home, completely fagged out at 10 o'clock in the morning, I took one look at my favorite chair, the big, deep, soft one, and then sank down into it good and hard. Ow! Ooh, something that felt like a broken beer bottle stabbed me. I reached for it, and it turned out to be the jagged chunk of the Indian bowl I dropped in my pocket earlier. For the first time, I really looked at the hieroglyphics on it. There were three Indian figures. The first was breaking sticks into uneven lengths. The second was holding a small fish, and the third was <laughs> running away with all the wampum. It took me a long time, but I finally got it, I think. The Indian picture message could only be translated one way. It had to mean never give a sucker an even break. And right then and there, I thought about Mona and what she'd said. That's when I'll take my gift back again. So long, Phil, baby. So long, baby. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore. Tonight's story was produced and directed by Cliff Howell. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Hans Conried, Clark Gordon, Howard Culver, Peter Leeds, Jane Webb, and Jane Avello. The special music is written and conducted by Richard O'Rant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... Inside of two hours, a lavish mansion seethed with suspicion. A sealed cabin filled with gas and an artist's retreat had a corpse on the floor. All because one man was too good-looking to be true to anyone. There'll be a couple of unusual twists for mystery fans on Gangbusters and on Basil Rathbone's adventure tonight. Gangbusters will present a former chief of detectives on the New York City police, narrating the case of a bet on a long shot that ended in murder. Basil Rathbone's drama will find that suave gentleman going to jail himself in order to deliver a man to the police. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.